Hi there. Welcome to We Sam's World. Thank you for tuning in live on Adobe Radio Thursdays at 3 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. If you're watching us on YouTube, you are in for a treat today. We have a very, very special guest that I was super excited to talk to. We had an amazing conversation. We're going to introduce her in just a little bit. Right now, we do our daily intro and check and it's not daily i should say weekly intro with peyton peyton how are you doing dude doing good yeah but you gotta call me by my nickname and i'm not gonna do that because we have new listeners on the show today <laughs> and i don't want to scare them off right away and in full disclosure for everybody listening we redid this intro we were about a minute in and i was like and i was ready to screw it up uh, it, we, again we got a little out of hand, and I remembered that we have a lot of new listeners today because of our guest and what we're going to be talking about with the Mars rover Perseverance, the latest mission by NASA to yes. explore life on Mars. That is just incredible to me. I've always wanted to bring something like somebody, somebody involved in this on the show and talk about it, and we had a wonderful discussion. We could have talked for another, like, two hours easily yeah but i wanted everybody to have a nice intro to this kind of topic and i think we did it real quick uh pilot season a little flat a little flat starting off but it's fine it's picking up again it's picking up and i'm really happy about that good we were discussing you started playing a new video game correct I did which one is it it's called we were here and it's free on yeah. um, PlayStation, if you got a PlayStation out there, and it's so up your alley, you would love it. Okay, what's it about? It Describe is a two-person uh, survival puzzle game. All right? One person is called the Librarian. Okay. One person is called the Explorer. And you are separated in this giant castle. Uh, one person's in one room. One person is the other. The Librarian has clues to certain puzzles that the explorer has to go through and kind of has to navigate them through this treacherous castle. So, for example, one of the first uh, ones we did, like, there were uh, these pressure plates, and I had, like, a map, and there were these weird directions that were telling the person, like, what pressure plate they need to step on, and it's, it's insane. There was a demon that started chasing me at one point. It was great. Wow, okay. Two hours long. Just find, like, an afternoon... Uh, people are always making rooms in there. You can play with a stranger, right. and it's so much fun. Yeah, highly recommend. Well, well, I, I'm I'm gonna have to look into this. This seems yes. very very fun. Uh, we're recording this just for everybody listening. A few days before uh, Thursday, we usually do that uh, because we want to make sure we have enough time to edit. Um, and when we say edit, we don't really edit that much out of the show. <laughs> it's more just for having time to put it all together yeah and what we do um so we are recording this the day before valentine's day and we discussed this uh i, I don't believe in celebrating valentine's day and i think if you do celebrate it doing it the day before or after it's totally fine and it's actually better because then the restaurants aren't packed right yep. yeah now, now, my mom <laughs> listening to this is going to go, oh, we Sam, how do you know that you celebrate Valentine's Day? How do you? And I'm like, uh, oh, I, 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 I might know from experience. I might not know. And nobody will ever know. And that's the beauty of keeping your private life private. That's right. Yeah. Because guess what? For me, nobody's business. Right. For you, you're married. Now it's everybody's business. I know. We both <laughs> despise Valentine's Day, though, so... Yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, it's, but all power to you if you do it, if you do it, if you do it, cool. That's cool. We like to save money. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it's about at the end of the day. Yeah. Saving money. That's it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I would like to start the introduction. Do we, how, how far into this We're intro? Five minutes in. Five minutes in. I'm already tired of talking <laughs> with you, Peyton. I'm kidding. It's, I'm kidding. That's how we can. So it's been an it. interesting week. Has it? It's been a very interesting waiting, waiting game week for me career-wise. Mm -hmm. Because of COVID, a lot of things have slowed down in my world. The pilot um, I shot for, or I was starting to shoot for NBC last year, Echo, we're still on hold, whether it's going to be picked up again this spring from NBC. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I've had some other pilot auditions, which have gone great. Yeah. And um, my voice is cracking, not because I'm emotional, because we had a little mis mishap this morning. Oh, yeah. And we had some technical <laughs> difficulties on top of me totally not pressing the right button on Google calendars, which... Oh, yeah. Google calendars needs to fix this problem immediately. Hmm. Um, it automatically sets things to 9 a.m. I don't know why. Oh, that's why it did that. Yeah. I thought 9 was a weird time. I was but, like, we never do the show that early. Right. Um, and... Thank goodness we also had technical difficulties in the beginning. Yeah. Because I, we would, I would have been late. Would have been late. Yeah. But even if I was here, we still, still had the technical difficulties. So uh, we appreciate our guests for being patient with us. It was just 10 minutes, but still. Uh, yeah. We like to be on time here. <laughs> we like to be respectful. You know how it goes. Um, I, I, I've been finding a lot of uh, difficulty even working out. During this time, yeah. I feel unmotivated. It's not like you. It's not like me, man. I don't like it. Are my testosterone levels down? Maybe. I don't know. They don't, don't feel know. down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just unmotivated. Like, I don't want to. I just want to work. I just want to do acting. Yeah. I did have some great sessions, though, with my brother. Okay. We were practicing some acting work, and he had a great audition for NCIS LA. Nice. Wonderful. Nailed it. Also worked with uh, Alex, our social media producer. She had a great monologue, and she's been hustling on the um, the acting front as well. She's nice. She's been doing crazy good work, and she sent out over 400 emails to reps. 400. So not a lazy person, <laughs> right? 400 emails? Not lazy, crazy. Crazy person. No, I'm no, kidding. No, no. I'm no. kidding. Oh. Like, do you even send 400 emails in a year, Peyton? Yeah. Okay. Well, I do. I do. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe maybe it takes you for, seven for, months for the moment. For the moment, no, no, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. It takes you maybe probably like seven months. It does. It'll months. take me a while, but yeah. yeah. An email a day. That's actually a good question. I probably send an email a day, at least an email a day. Yeah. Yeah. I I want to talk about our guest. I know we're supposed to wait a little bit, but I can't wait anymore. Okay. Our guest today is Eva Scheller. She is a PhD student at Caltech of Geological Sciences. She is the lead for strategic planning process on the Mars Perseverance rover, which, if you're listening on Adobe Live, Adobe Radio Live today, has hopefully already landed. And, oh my gosh, that... That whole world of people who deal with the Mars rovers mm -hmm. and, and, and shooting things into space, that astounds me. Yeah. Because it's literally out of this world for me. <laughs> literally. And literally. Emotionally out of this world. Because for most of us, we live our lives in our city or our hometown for most of our existence. Mm -hmm. And the idea of leaving literally the plane of where we live doesn't even enter our minds and now we're shooting things and mechanical robots to planets that are hundreds of millions of miles away from us right and not just like a straight shoot either they have to like calculate the trajectory of where it's going where the planet's going to be so the rover or the spacecraft lands in that exact in, in that exact space that to me is just an absolutely incredible and that's why i wanted to have somebody from this field on the show so we can share this miracle that I think is important to think about and talk about. Um, so basically, Eva d helps dictate which path the rover is going to drive. Mm. And she's uh, also a science collaborator on the instruments. And briefly, just talking about it, the whole purpose of this mission is to figure out was there life on Mars? This is the first mission to figure out. Yeah. Is there life on Mars? I don't know. I don't know. They also want to figure out if there is or isn't, why? And we talk about it on the show. They found a very specific place that could be a hot spot for potential microbial life. Mm. Now, here's the kicker of all this, Peyton. Okay. 
What if we find life on Mars? Is that going to change your view on life, on the universe? Yeah. Yeah? Because I don't believe in aliens. Okay. So, yeah, that would change everything. That would be a, a big <laughs> world flipper for you. Yeah. Wow. Do you think you would still keep some of your maybe spiritual beliefs intact? Oh, my spiritual beliefs would. Yeah, they'd stay intact. Gotcha. I'd just be like, oh, shit, there are aliens. Yeah. That's cool. Right. <laughs> so simple. I know. I, I would just literally be like, that's cool. Right. Let's invite them. Let's what have a it, tea party. What if it's not like <laughs> it's not aliens, aliens. But like, no, I know. Right, right. But like micro microbes. Like that to me is Oh, yeah. Then we start going, okay. Right. Why are there microbes there? Mhm. Mm you know how did they come about? Right. Why did they die out? Yeah. I sometimes think there might be stuff underneath the surface, we like in cave digging. systems. Yeah. We find a civilization down there of patrons. Uh, whoa. Just a, a complete Oh, no wonder they went patrons. extinct and yeah. had to dig under. Things did not go well. No. No. <laughs> no. No. Millions of me on one planet, I give them a year. They die out. Like a it's year? Done. A year. That's generous. I know. <laughs> no offense, that's generous. I give them one year. One year? They'll eat each other, and then like one will be left. And yeah, I'll... You're the one that's left. I'm the one you that... made it back. <laughs> Dude, we're idiots. We are, we are, we are. That's why we don't work for NASA. That's why we don't work for NASA. That's why we're actors. That's right. That's, <laughs> it's the first rule of being an actor. Are you an idiot? You're hired. Hired. Come on board. <laughs> <laughs> Can you play pretend really well? Do Welcome. you sometimes want work and then sometimes not have work? Come on down. <laughs> How far are we into this? Oh, uh, we're good. We're good? We're good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know you've been waiting for this. I'm really excited. Let's give a warm welcome to Eva Scheller. Eva, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm super excited to have you on, and I'm super excited for all of our listeners to hear about everything that you and the uh, Mars Rover Perseverance team are doing because it's an absolute miracle in my opinion. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And yeah. Glad to talk with all your listeners. Yeah. <laughs> I think we take for granted nowadays the technology that's available to us. And I'm guilty of that as well. Whenever I hear, oh, they shot another satellite into orbit or, oh, there's another Mars rover. And then I go, oh, that's so cool. And then I go on with my daily life. And I don't think we're, a, a lot of us are taking the time to appreciate really the miracle and the ingenuity and the perseverance <laughs> of, what that, of what that entails. And the amount of people and the money and the blood and the sweat and the tears and everything that's involved in it, not only for, from this generation, but from generations previous of scientists and mathematicians, etc. Yeah, that's very true. Like the, I think the space community in general is in one of its biggest periods of rapid development technology wise. Like we have a lot of startup companies and SpaceX and everything is happening very fast right now. But that's obviously building on a funda foundation that's been there since the 60s. And I, I certainly think that the history should be appreciated. But yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. How a did lot you... of exciting things are happening right now. Yeah. How did you get um, into uh, uh, this field? What, what sparked your interest? Yeah. Um, so how far do you want me to go back? Because I can go back really far or I can just go back to college. <laughs> well, I just want to, I just want to give people like a brief uh, little intro to who you are. Uh, so as far back as you think is relevant. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, a very common thing for people who work in space exploration is that they had some kind of spark or some kind of passion for 
space and exploring space very early on. So a lot of us uh, grew up watching space documentaries and following the space news when we were kids and just had a big passion for it as kids. And so that was a very similar situation for me. I am what's called a planetary geologist. And that means I actually have an education in geology, but my research is on uh, space exploration or understanding the geology of other planets. So for me personally, my sort of, um, my interest in space exploration was paired with my interest in understanding nature and understanding geology, because I also, as a kid, had a passion for just going hiking and <laughs> collecting rocks, and I didn't really grow out of that. And uh, by the time I had to choose my major in college, I was like, well, I can basically just turn it into a career. And so that's what I did. Yeah. That's wonderful. And how did you get involved with this program specifically? Yeah, so, yeah, so that is back in college. So I'm originally from Denmark in Europe. And I had the opportunity to go study abroad at a place that I work at now that's called uh, the California Institute of Technology or Caltech, that is actually um, kind of owns a part of NASA that's called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, collaboration between Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or JPL. And so when I was studying abroad, I got to learn about that you could actually, as a researcher, work on these different uh, NASA missions. And I eventually decided that I wanted to pursue a PhD. And so I applied to go back to this institution where I studied abroad and to work with all of these researchers that are involved with the NASA missions. And so that's how I got involved. That's, that's incredible. As a little backstory, and I know I mentioned this in the intro, but we are we have pre-recorded this intro and while people are listening to this live on the radio or the, the next day on YouTube or any podcast app, the Rover has hopefully landed (laughs) in, in a safe way. And it's uh, already starting what it needs to do out there. So I just want to make sure people uh, realize that if they're curious as to when this was recorded, et cetera, but as timing would have it, this air is the exact same day. The, rover land so fingers crossed i hope everything goes smoothly for you guys yep i certainly hope so as well um yeah we'll know by then (laughs) (laughs) how stressful is it for everybody during that during the time you you were mentioning something to me a while ago and you were saying something the seven minutes of silence or something like that where you lose radio contact is that correct Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, so we call what's called entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. We call that, uh, as a nickname, the seven minutes of terror. So the whole process of the spacecraft entering the atmosphere and then the rover getting to land on the surface takes seven minutes. It's completely automated, so there's no human involvement in the process. So we all sort of have to just sit back and let the rover do its thing. And it takes seven minutes. And then after those seven minutes, you know whether your life's work crashed and burned or it's survived. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, that's, that, that's well named then, the seven minutes of yeah. terror. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, was, that, I was... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, that, that is sort of the game of space exploration because... The thing about it is that you don't have, we have ways of testing it, right? We can simulate what it's going to be like in space, but we can't sort of try a lot of times and then fail and then learn from it. It's sort of like we have to be perfect the very first time that we do it. So yeah, that's, that's really why it's terror. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, then that's actually one of my first questions that I want to ask, but before I I asked something about that. I looked on here. The rover has traveled over almost 286 million miles. That's 
mind boggling to me. How the heck do you guys get that right the first time? Where do you practice these things? And, and how, how do you make sure all, all this ends up being the right way of doing it? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are people that basically calculate what we call orbital mechanics. So they have models where they take into account, you know, the rotation of the planets, the distance between the planets, the right, the exact right point that you send up the rocket and the exact right speed that you need to uh, be flying in order to get on the right uh, path. Uh, and so th this is basically uh, calculations that people do. So really, really extensive calculations. Um, and then those, we have obviously had some experience because we have had uh, the moon landings. We have had a lot of uh, satellites go to Mars. We've had other rovers go to Mars. So we have had some practice doing these calculations. Um, and yeah, we wow. the people who do this have so far <laughs> been right uh, every time. Yeah. <laughs> so the foundation is math, it seems like. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a good way of putting math and physics. Yeah. Math and physics. Yes. That's incredible. And another amazing feat of this mission is the, the, um, the different types of professionals and scientists and uh, experts in the field all working together because you need people who are experts in uh, calculating the orbital, you know, uh, velocity, I think it's called, I don't know. And then you need geologists, you need people who, you know, like all these different scientists to work together as a team. And how would you describe that atmosphere? Are you, do you feel like you guys as a whole have a really good communication and, and, and positivity in, in the team? Yeah, it, that's a really good question. So I was actually recently on another podcast and someone asked me, what is the thing that makes me feel hope every day? And I answered that actually my work on this team is one of the, the things that I feel uh, really gives me a lot of positive energy every day. And the reason is, it's exactly as you say, you have all of these people that come from very different fields and not only very different scientific fields, but they also come from countries all over the world. So all these different cultures, these huge diversity in the team uh, and uh, we all come together with the same goal which is making this rover mission a success and everyone is very uh, collaborative and positive and uh, really try their best to learn each other's material because it's it's very true that sometimes you do have to bridge uh, differences in in the knowledge and perspective that people come with and yeah the team does a really good job of that Absolutely. I can only parallel it to filmmaking where a director is working with the art director. He's then the art director is working with the, the, the people who actually construct this, the, the, the sets. And they're like, Oh, this is like, we need more money to construct the set this way. Oh, we don't have more money. We have to go back to the director. Hey, is there any way you can, you know, bend your idea a little bit. And it's a constant balancing act of making sure that everybody's able to do their job, but the mission is still, uh, accomplished at the same time that's uh it's that's the only thing i can parallel it to and i can only imagine how much more complicated it gets uh with uh with yeah, science and engineers and everything yeah that that's that's actually sort of hitting the nail on its head because what often happens on these uh, especially the rover missions is that the scientists like me we have a certain goal that we need to achieve because that's the the whole re reason we have the mission is we want to achieve our scientific goals. And so you have to travel to specific places because that's where we think we need to do this analysis and that will tell us this thing and that is what's going to augment our knowledge. But going there, so scientists oftentimes just assume, yeah, we'll just go there. And then it's up to the engineers <laughs> to figure out how to get there. And it's <laughs> not always uh, the easiest thing to do. So we often have He's uh, back and forth like that. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are like, we want to go here. They're like, we, it's hard. Well, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah. And that is actually part of the uh, entry descent landing system has been made sort of for the scientists to be able to land where we're going to land because we are actually going to land a very difficult place because scientists uh, really find this place interesting, but it's not very flat. If you want to land something, you want to have a very flat surface that will be optimal. So the engineers actually made this system where a rover can take pictures of the ground and by taking these pictures, it then analyzes them and um, the, uh, the landing system can adjust the movement of the landing craft and, uh, and that sort of enable us to land at this very difficult place that's interesting scientifically, but really difficult engineering wise. Yeah. Wow. So what's the whole purpose of this mission? Why, why is Perseverance going to Mars right now? Why are we going to Mars again? Yeah, really good question. So there is an overall goal and there's several other goals and I'll start with the first one. So the, the major goal we're going is that uh, the Perseverance rover is the first rover that's going to search for actual evidence of life on past Mars. So it has some instruments that can actually search for these evidences. And uh, second to that, a lot of the times, if you uh, are searching for these evidences of past life, you actually do need really detailed laboratory analysis. And that actually requires for you to bring the samples to Earth such that scientists can study them in the laboratory. So uh, we, there's actually a sampling system on the Perseverance rover in which the, the rover will be collecting samples and there would then be a subsequent mission that um, takes these samples and delivers them back to Earth that can enable scientists to see if there's evidences for life in these materials. So that's the overall goal is to answer the question, is there life, was there ever life on Mars? Um, so then the, there's sort of two other, I would say uh, equally important goals, which is when you are trying to answer the question, was there life on Mars? You also want to answer the question why or why not? Um, so why would there have been life on Mars or why wasn't there life on Mars, especially when we compare Mars to Earth? And that's where you want to understand the geological events or what we call the geological history that could have made the environment of Mars conducive to having life or could have made the environment not conducive to having life. So that's another question we want to answer. So what are these geological events that we can study for rocks with the rover um, that could have led to life? And this, the third thing is that this is also a next step towards human exploration of Mars. So we have an experiment that will be looking at um, whether we can create actually breathable air out of the Martian atmosphere because the Martian atmosphere is very different from Earth's atmosphere. And, uh, and this whole thing of collecting samples and then sending it back to Earth, in a sense, is the first step. Can we take a rock and send it back to Earth? Because we want to make sure we can do that before we send a human there and try to get them back to Earth, right? Um, so yeah, those are the three goals. Wow, that is a pretty life view and world changing uh, mission. Because immediately when you were saying, we're trying to find life on, evidence of life on Mars, what if we do? Oh my gosh, that's gonna yeah. turn everything upside down okay the way we viewed the universe has changed how do we move forward from this now and i think it's important to do that to always question things to find new answers for you know where has life been might eventually lead us to what is the purpose of life yeah, that's very true. I mean, in a sense, um, you know, any any research, scientific research that you do sort of has to have a <laughs> motivation behind it, right? People yeah. need to fund it. And this is one of 
very well-funded area of scientific research, I think because every human sort of has that existential consideration, like, are we alone in the universe? Like, every human experiences that. And uh, yeah, that's that's sort of what the the mission is, uh, the scientific goal of the mission is building upon, is yeah. trying to answer that question. But equally as important, even if we don't uh, find life on Mars, um, again, this question of why or why not, uh, I think is equally as important and maybe not always gets uh, fought about uh, in the sort of non-scientific community. community. So, um, so equally as important, why was there life on Earth if there was not life on these planets that look very much like Earth and behave very much like Earth? Yeah. Right. Uh, the man. So this r- rover and I and I went to the website um, that you guys have. And just for anybody who would like to check out the website as you're listening to this or watching this, it's mars.nasa.gov slash insight. Is that correct? Oh, Insight is a different uh, oh, rover I'm so- mission. So we have, we have Oh several. my gosh, I'm so sorry. Not Insight. <laughs> which, 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 where's the right website? Perseverance. There we go. It's Perseverance. Perseverance. Yeah. That's the one you guys are doing. Gotcha. Okay, there we go. All right, that, that clarifies things. But it's uh, mars.nasa.gov. Click on Perseverance. And it's really cool what you guys do. You have a countdown to landing. You have how far it's traveled. And there's a lot of information where people can kind of get a really generalized view of, of what's happening with the rover. Uh, I, I love how you guys have a, a, today's weather on Mars, too, which uh, currently the high is zero degrees and the low is negative 99. Sounds which about is, right. <laughs> which is not too far away from the Midwest right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have to take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, I've got a lot more questions. And uh, I know you'll have a lot more answers. So we'll be back. All right. We are back. Now, I have a question, Eva. I saw that there was the the Perseverance uh, rover. Is there droids on it as well? Uh, So... I think maybe you're referring to the helicopter. So we have this uh, other sort of um, a vehicle that's called the Ingenuity, and that's a, a small helicopter. I'm an idiot. Is that the one? Yeah, I'm an <laughs> idiot. I just called it a droid like it's from Star Wars. It's a drone. <laughs> that's the clip. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually yeah. a difference between uh, a drone and a helicopter, and that's just... I think anyways, that it's just uh, how uh, the sort of propellers are, are situated on the, on the vehicle. But okay. in any case, this is like a helicopter in the sense that it has these like two propellers on the top. Um, and yeah, that's, that's totally correct. That's a super new thing that we're doing. So the rover is going to come with this uh, helicopter. I was going to say a small helicopter, but it's actually quite large. How big and is it? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't know because uh, I, I didn't have the chance to go and see it before they shipped it uh, to launch. Gotcha. Um, but I, I think it's probably a couple meters in, uh, in uh, wingspan. What's that wow. in feet? Uh, six feet or something? I don't know. Uh, wow. That's something you can look up on the website anyways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, what we call a tech demo. So that vehicle, uh, because as I said before, the Martian atmosphere is really different from Earth's. It's actually sort of a question. Can we actually get something to fly there? Um, and so this is the engineer's opportunity to demonstrate, yes, we can get something. We can get a helicopter to fly there. Um, and that's what we're going to try to do with uh, Ingenuity. It does have a camera, so the scientists are really hoping that we'll get to take some pictures, like you know, some like drone pictures uh, of the surface as well. That will be really, uh, really awesome and helpful. Um, now, yeah. Now, the, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure it's hard for us to take video because it takes too long for the the signal to get from Mars to Earth. Is that why? 
Yeah, there's a lot of, um, so the, the whole system of, so basically the rover has to send all of its information to a satellite and then that satellite sends it to an antenna system and then that sends it to NASA. So that whole process is actually really long and there is a also only a certain capacity for how large your files can be essentially. Um, so I think that's part of the reason. Um, and if we're going to talk about more about instruments, you can see that there is a, a, a large suite of different instruments that have very heavy data. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's let's talk about a balancing what, act. Oh, I yeah, a little bit. <laughs> You make it sound so like it's a little bit of a balancing act. We got all these things going. We're on another planet. We're trying to do this and that. And we're, we're, uh, you know, compromised because we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, bandwidth on everything. And it's just so far away. Um, I can barely, uh, no, I can, I can, I have good direction, uh, directional skills in Los Angeles. My producer though does not, he can get lost very easily in LA. So I can only imagine him trying to get to Mars would be basically impossible at this point. <laughs> Um, so what, let's talk about your specific job on this mission. What do you do on it? Sure. Um, yeah, I do a few different things. So I am part of what's called the science team. So the science team on the rover are all of these different scientists from different universities and also from, uh, JPL itself in different places, uh, at NASA. And we come together to discuss all the science and there's many different parts to that. It's actually a very well-planned process. So what we first did uh, when we were selecting the landing site and trying to understand how we could achieve these goals of uh, searching for past life on Mars, we had a very long process of actually selecting the landing site. So that's when I started out and I was looking at these uh, different landing sites that were the finalists for selection then eventually the science team came together and we selected what's called Jezero Crater, which is where it's going to land. So then we moved on to what we call the strategic planning. So we want to plan how is the rover going to drive such that we can achieve all these different science questions from all these different scientists that have all these different questions they want answered. And so I was one of the strategic planning leads that was uh, sort of organizing um, the traverse that the rover is going to take to achieve all these science goals. And the other thing that I do is I'm on, on a scientist on two of the instruments. So the first one is called Mascam Z, and that's the main camera that can actually take pictures and it actually has a, a zoom function. So it can zoom in and take really detailed pictures of the surface. And then I'm on this other instrument that's called Sherlock. And that gets a little bit more complicated uh, because it's what we call a spectrometer. But basically what it is, is that it can shoot a laser on the surface and then it can measure what energies come back uh, after you shoot the laser on the material. And then it can, uh, using that energy spectrum, it tells you what is the material that you're looking at. So it can tell mm. you, are you looking at organics or are you looking at a mineral? Um, yeah, so Whoa. I actually do a lot of different things, but that was a comprehensive overview. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That, that blew my mind. So basically this laser burns a part, uh, uh, burns something, right? That looks like a rock or whatever. And it can tell you afterwards this, this spectro spectrometer, is that what it's called? Yeah, so the, act, the scientific name for the technique that we use is called Raman spectroscopy. Yeah, so it wow. uses a Raman spectrometer, yeah. And it can determine from there whether it's a mineral or something that was organic. Yeah, yeah. And it can tell you Whoa. also which kind of organic and which kind of mineral. So it's a very detailed analysis when you're trying to understand materials of, of the surface. Is this a new technology or is this has been around for a little bit? So... Yes and no. <laughs> so the technique Raman spectroscopy has been around for a long time. It's a very standard technique in, uh, in you know, a lot of chemical research and stuff like that. Right. And the kind of research that I do. This particular Raman spectrometer is actually 
pretty new because um, that gets a little bit technical, but basically the laser, the technology that goes into making this laser is very specifically designed to this finding life on Mars question. Right. Um, because we, we want to understand these organics particularly. So it's very, it's very fine tuned to be able to both tell us about these organics and these minerals, which is not something a, a usual Raman spectrometer can do. So gotcha. Yes and no. Yeah. Yes and no. Yes. You know, this location site that you chose has to be something that has been talked about within your team over and over and over again, because it's not the type of thing where I could imagine where you're like, you've chosen a site and then the rover is already halfway to Mars. And you're like, actually, can we choose another site on the other side of the planet? You know, it's something yeah. that you guys have to go, Hey, we looked at all these satellite photos. Um, there's this one specific place I'm imagining that has so much more potential than all the other pictures that you guys looked at and that's how you decided it? Yeah, for sure. So maybe this is when I should pull in some images that I have yeah. uh, of this process that we did for selecting this. Eva, I'm, so, I'm sorry, to inter what, but was I right? Is that how you guys do it? Yeah, so I'm, oh, I will, I will, I will, I'll tell you the story. I'm, I'm right. <laughs> I can be a scientist now for NASA. <laughs> So should I'm I'm I kidding. just screen share or? Yeah, um, go ahead and screen share. Uh, okay. does she, do you have uh, permission on our Zoom link to screen share? Oh, I actually don't. So I think you have to make me co-host. Can we make her co-host real quick? Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Peyton. Um, oh, uh, participants. And yeah, you, I think you just click on hers more and make host. Yep, there it is. The future is happening right now. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, that works. Great. So now oh, great. we're here. Okay, yeah, because I like this little animation. So Ooh. you're seeing the globe of Mars here. Great. And it's going to three different places. So Northeastern is major. Wow. Columbia Hills and Jezero Crater. Those were the three finalist landing sites that the scientists were discussing for um, many, many years. So I actually don't know how long this whole process was because uh, it started before I was even in college. Um, and uh, basically all the scientists got to say, this is my favorite site and I think we should land here because of these and these and these scientific reasons. They got to publish on it and they got to present on it such that the whole Martian science community could learn about it. And then eventually we had these uh, periods of voting where everyone in the Martian community could vote on uh, which landing site they liked better, oh. uh, given all of these arguments that scientists have presented. So these three were the final uh, sites. And then we all, everyone traveled, whoops, my airport just fell down. Everyone traveled to Pasadena, which is where I live. And that's where uh, JPL is to vote on which of these three landing sites we're going to go to. And um, eventually, whoops. So here's again, you can, this is a global map of Mars and you can see uh, there's actually four different ones because we, we put in <laughs> this, this extra landing site uh, actually pretty late in the process because it was right in between these two different ones that I already showed you. Okay. And eventually, yeah, we did, we decided on Jezero Crater, uh, which you can see in a context image there. I, just um, to just so I can get some reference, it says on the bottom that that little scale that's two hundred kilometers, which is about a hundred and twenty miles. No, that's not right. Hundred and forty miles. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Let me. My 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 producer is um is uh, checking that real quick. Just so I, is it how much? Yeah. 124. I was right. I'm so smart, Eva. I know. <laughs> I don't, I'm just, you know, I'm really smart. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Totally kidding. Um, I mean, okay. for all of my, for all of my sort of attempt to integrate American society, I've never quite gotten on the miles and feet system yet. <laughs> so I still yeah. don't know why we're on it, to be completely frank with you. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's about 120 miles. Wow, that's, 
that's significant. Wow. Okay. I can see why. Wow. Yeah. So, so here I'm sort of zooming into a larger sort of a, a larger region of Mars and just to give you a little bit of scale actually for how small these landing sites are. So, so the, the landing site is here where the star is. So mm -hmm. we can, we can zoom into that place in the next image. So here you actually see, okay, this is, this is what we're going to be looking at. And so you, the scale here is saying 10 kilometers. So the, this, I don't know if you, can you see this circular feature? So that's something scientists look for. Right. Um, that's what we call an impact crater. So yes. wow. uh, people might have heard about impact craters because of asteroids impacting into earth and killing all the dinosaurs. And that's what we're looking at here. Right. Um, and so, yeah, for the sense of scale, it's about 30 kilometers across and the, the circle in black right here, that is what's called the landing ellipse. So that's where the rover, uh, people have calculated where can the rover land and that is uh, where it can land and where the scientists want to go. Yeah. So just for people listening on the radio and if you're from the LA area, it's basically a crater that would totally encompass uh, downtown LA to Santa Monica, uh, I believe. And it looks massive and there's a smaller circle within the circle that would probably encompass uh, the the greater part of downtown, if I'm not mistaken, that's yeah. I think I think you're spot on. Yeah, those are those are the size metrics. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. And so you guys decided on that one space. Now, why for you is that space really, really a good space to land? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's sort of why I pulled out these images. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it does get a little bit complicated, uh, but I'll, I'll walk you guys through it. So again, yeah, this circular feature that you're seeing, that's the impact crater. So we notice some extra things about this. There are some sort of semi-sinusoidal features here. Yes. That connect to the circle. Yeah, you see it? Yeah, it looks like <laughs> a river. Or like it looks a like a river. That's the, that's the argument, yep. So- uh, these, Whoa, so okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting excited here because <laughs> this is big to me. That shows, obviously, I mean, there had to be water on Mars then. Exactly. Yep. Whoa. That, and so there's something even more extraordinary about this site. So we have these channels yeah, that we recognize. They look exactly like the rivers that people study a lot on Earth. Um, you can recognize it based on some, you know, very specific metrics that I won't get into detail about. But this, a, this is basically a ancient river channel. So the water is not there anymore, but the water carved this, this channel in the past. And it leads into this, uh, this circular depression. So this is a hole in the ground. It's basically a bowl shaped hole in the ground. And so that might lead you to think about a lake. So here we have a sort of artist rendition oh. of how scientists interpret this environment. Um, so we get, you think there was a river and it led into basically a, a big lake. Wow. Now, there's actually something really interesting that happens when you have a river running into a lake. Because a river is, you know, flowing water, water is moving at a high velocity, but in a lake, uh, the water is not really moving on that much, right? It's standing still. So that change in velocity actually causes you to a lot of sort of small pieces of rock or what we call sediments to fall out of the water. And, and that's what we have preserved in Jezero. So that's what you see in this image here. It's this fan shape. We call it a fan shape actually. Yes. Where all this material falls out of the water. That's really important because not only did we have this lake environment that is uh, the, the reason that we like to find liquid water on Mars is because uh, liquid water is a really important constituent of creating an environment that is conducive for uh, organisms to, to live in. But this, this fan shape is really important because it's really good at preserving these evidences for life. Ah. So because it's sort of like, okay, maybe we had life there, but we won't be able to see it with the rover. 
we need to go to an environment where we're likely to preserve um, these evidences. So these fan shapes that we call deltas on Earth are really good at that. Um, for example, that's where we find a lot of coal on Earth. So coal really is just plants that were preserved in some kind of rock. Um, so yeah, wow. that's why this was the ultimate winner. Yeah. So we, um, our time on Adobe Radio has almost come to an end, but we're going to continue talking so people can listen to the full episode of this tomorrow morning. Uh, on YouTube. They can watch us. They can see all the pictures, which I highly recommend, or they can download it, the audio on Spotify or podcast. But I highly suggest for everybody to go to our YouTube channel, We Sam's World. Subscribe, watch this video because you've got some amazing pictures and we've got some more pictures and hopefully some videos that we can show as well. And um, thank you for everybody for tuning into Adobe Radio. And make sure you follow us on Instagram, We Sam's World. Follow us on Twitter, We Sam's underscore world. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel, We Sam's World. Thanks for tuning in on Adobe Radio Live. Eva, let's continue. This is really okay. cool. Um, your your crater. I see that the the fan shape that you're talking about within that fan shape. I see a little crater. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's another now, crater. Yeah. Do you think that happened after everything was dried up, or do you think that was there while the water was there? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know that we 100% know the answer, but it certainly formed after this whole fanship was formed, right? So because you can you can clearly see the fanship underneath and then the craters on top. Um, so it's certainly a lot younger than than this whole water system. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let's let's keep going. I love this. <laughs> I feel like a yeah. little kid right now. I feel like I'm I'm on an adventure. It's great. That's good. Yeah. And, you know, please, you know, ask me any questions if I'm talking about something that you don't understand, but uh, hopefully everything I'm saying sort of makes sense. You're doing uh, great. You're doing okay. great. Yeah. Let's keep going. Um, yeah. So that, that is this, we call it the Jezero Delta. So it's the Jezero Crater, the Jezero Delta inside. Right. Um, and the idea is that we are going to land somewhere around here. Um, perhaps we can land on the delta, perhaps we'll land uh, down here, which is just what we call the crater floor. So that's the more flat part. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll drive up this delta and we'll look at um, all of the materials inside this delta. And we'll, again, yeah, we'll look for uh, preserved evidences for past life. That's wonderful. Excuse yeah. me, I had a hiccup. Um, and then... Um, yeah, so you can see, so here, um, maybe you can see that it's sort of uh, protruding or there's like sort of a topographic high. Right. Um, that's the rim of this uh, crater bolt. So we'll be, we'll be starting inside the crater and yes. then we'll drive up this delta and outside of this crater bowl, basically. That's, that's wow, that's, that, that feels like a long ways to travel. Now, now Eva, what is in your mind best case scenario let's say if you could have it anyway where would you land what would be a dream for you guys to find and what would that uh what would you want to find would it be plant like cellular plant life or fossil from what would look like something that was uh, like a uh, small insect or maybe like a microplankton kind of thing what would be best case scenario for you yeah that's a very good question um, I actually, uh, I have another picture that shows this really well, but I'll get to it once we, once we get to that. Um, so yes. So, uh, there is, again, there's a lot of different things that different researchers want to find, and there's a lot of different goals in play here. So we have these overall three goals, but we have a lot of sub goals as well. Um, in terms of finding this evidence for the uh, preserved evidence for past life um there is a there's different scales to it so what we're really hoping to find in the field with the rover is certain structures within rocks that are linked to biological activity so those are those are really sort of common 
structures that you find on Earth in which you know some uh, bacteria or some kind of microbes must have interacted with the rock to create this um, structure. Mm -hmm. um, a common word for it is stromatolite or microbialite for those who are a bit more into the scientific term. I, I have that tattooed on my arm. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's really what we're hoping to find uh, with the rover, because when, when we're, I'm sort of saying we're looking for preserved evidence of past life, the assumption is that the life was probably bacteria, because we have not seen any evidence for, you know, insects or some larger kind of organism. We also don't exactly know what we're looking for because we only have one data point, which is Earth. <laughs> so we don't actually, we don't have a reference point for what life would be like on other planets. But, uh, but the assumption is it's probably a bacteria that is very, very small. And there needs to be something a little bit larger that we can actually see with the rover. Now, yeah. once we sample and we get those samples back to Earth, we hope that we can take some of these really good microscopes that we have and actually be able to see these bacteria. That mm. would be, um, that would be, that would change everything. Yeah. How the, how, now I, I forgot to ask this earlier cause I got too excited. Uh, how the heck are you going to bring it back to earth? Does the Rover have rockets or are you sending another Rover there? Or are you going to send Elon Musk there to go pick it up <laughs> and then come back? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, I would, I would vote for the third option. Um, <laughs> the, the, idea, <laughs> the, the idea is uh, it's a free part mission, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other part's in collaboration with ESA, which is the European Space Agency. Um, so first, we have this Perseverance rover that will sample all the free materials that we want, that we really think there's a chance we could put this under a microscope and find a bacteria. Um, and uh, then there will be another rover, as you say, and that rover is going to collect all of the samples and uh, maybe in some way sort of um, shoot them back into space again. And then there's going to be a spacecraft that actually collects those samples uh, from the atmosphere of Mars and then returns back to Earth. And so those two missions that will be in the future, I, I still a little bit on this sketchboard, but that's the, that's the full idea of this sort of three-part mission. But each of those three parts are their own sort of Perseverance rover. Each of them is a really large sort of NASA project. But gotcha. uh, eventually, they'll come back. Yeah. Wonderful. So definitely not Elon Musk. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the, the question is with SpaceX, um, is because SpaceX doesn't really do anything science-wise yet, but they have really good uh, engineering capabilities. So uh, I think it, eventually, you know, NASA will be very open to collaborating, but that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> no, of course. Um, well, you know what, here, here's my, might be a little bit of a controversial question. And I feel it's necessary to ask it because it's crossed my mind too. And I don't know if it's crossed your mind. I know NASA's budget for this seems like a lot of money. And how much is it again? Yeah, so we actually talked and I looked up that uh, it's about $2.7 billion in the end. $2.7 billion. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but then we compare it to, let's say, the military defense budget, and that's a small, small fraction, correct? Yeah, so it's sort of like, um, I think for any of these space missions, uh, it's, it's exactly as you say, the amount sounds uh, like a lot. But then if you think about all the different things that the government invests in, so, you know, it, it's literally anything that you can think of. It, it sort of is a little bit, um, that there needs to be a balance for everything, right? Like the military right. needs its budget, the science needs its budget. Um, some of these are larger than the others. <laughs> but, well, yeah. the, the, the question I have is this. Why do we need to bother going to another planet when we haven't solved certain problems here? You know, for instance, poverty, homelessness, cancer research, 
disease research, et cetera, et cetera. And I know a lot of that is not on you, Eva. Like you're not responsible for the budget, obviously. <laughs> like I know that, but why do you yeah, think that, it's- Yeah, that's a- way, way, way above my <laughs> <laughs> Eva, why aren't we doing this? Solve cancer. Uh, I just spit all over my computer screen. Um, <laughs> so why, why do we- why, why is it still important to go to Mars and do these experiments and, and, do, and, and do this while we still have all these problems here in, in the world? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So I think it comes back a little bit to, for me personally anyways, it comes back to what we discussed in the beginning, which is that this, I, I think there's two parts to it. So the first part is the sort of existential science question, are we alone in the universe? Uh, that sort of has almost unimaginable consequences for us to answer. Like it's kind of, as you said, like it kind of changes everything um, once we know that answer. Uh, I think that's, I don't know, it just, it's on par with understanding why are we here? What's, what's the meaning of life? Is there a God? Like it's sort of on par with that scale of question. So in my mind anyways, um, I find it to be, you know, sort of, you know, a very, a very meaningful question to try to answer. Um, then secondly, when we do this, uh, this space exploration, there's actually, just as I just talked about, there's a lot of technology that's actually developed uh, because we're really at the frontier of what engineering can do. So when we do space exploration, we're constantly sort of pushing boundaries from, from you know, both what computer science can do, what, what aerospace engineering can do, um, you know, all these, uh, what robotics can do. And so we're actually able to advance these fields. So aerospace, robotics, computer science, and all of these fields uh, are involved with things that are directly sort of uh, important to, to society. Like, um, yeah. yeah. So, so it's, it's actually like kind of, a, there's this existential part, but there's actually also this huge advancements in technology that NASA for a long time has sort of set, um, set the frontier for what engineering can do and uh, continue, continue to push what we can do uh, with, with our technology. Uh, that then later gets incorporated into uh, different societal functions. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you answered that very, very well. And we kind of forget the, uh, <laughs> the advancements in technology's uh, reason for traveling and, and going on these explorations, which are so important because it's the trial by fire. It's the test. Like, hey, can we actually do this technology-wise? Can, can we apply some of this stuff that we did in this mission to stuff here uh, in, in our society, in our world? Because if it's tested out in space, it can sure, it sure as heck work here, that kind of thing. Um, another thing, and we don't have to get too into this. I don't want to just because everybody has their own uh, uh, personal spiritual beliefs and religious beliefs. But I find it beautiful. And I just, I just think it needs to be said whenever someone's faith and spirituality marriages and works in harmony with science and philosophy. Because from a personal standpoint, I believe in one God and I don't think God would create a system and then work outside of it. I think the system that he's created is magnificent in its own right. And when those two all work together. That's where I think the harmony and the miracle of life happens. That's why I get amazed when I see humans being able to travel to another planet that's millions and millions and millions of miles of way and not just travel there, but hit it at an exact point and then be able to do these scientific studies and, and all this technology that they created based on foundational principles of, of math and physics of what our universe is basically uh, uh, strung together by that to me is the, the miracle of life. So, yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I feel like this is sort of a field where all of those questions sort of 
culminate. And that's why there's a lot of um, a, a lot of interest in being able to answer this yeah. very foundational question that we don't yet know the answer to. Absolutely. I'm trying to think. Let's see what other uh, you had some other pictures, if I'm not mistaken. I wanted to make sure we hit those. Um, do you have any? Um, let, let, can we show how this th how this rover is going to land? Do you have anything like that? Or yeah. Uh, so I have some pictures to show that. I also have a uh, YouTube uh, movie Great. from uh, NASA, sort of official movie. So which one would you rather like? Would you rather like the pictures or the movie? Let's uh, let's do the pictures first. I'm so hesitant to do a movie because of YouTube and there will be fine. Okay. You know what? We're going to go <laughs> in the spirit of exploration. Let's show the video. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, do you want me to screen share it or should I just send the link to you? Uh, oh, sc screen share it. I think it'll be fine. Okay. If it's a little choppy, um, we can have people just uh, see it for themselves or something. Okay. Yeah. The question is whether the sound will actually come through. It, it might not. Um, That's okay. Yeah. So then we'll just we'll watch it without sound, I guess. Yeah, we'll give it a commentary. Okay, yeah, seven minutes to Mars. <laughs> so you can you can go and uh, so NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory JPL has their own YouTube channel where they make all these things available. So wow, people that's can cool. go and watch it if they want. They have a Absolutely. lot of other movies too. So that's Earth, right? I'm kidding. <laughs> Now, all this is obviously artist uh, uh, renderings and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, that, uh, it's actually yeah. based on the satellite imagery that we do have. So we have a lot of satellites that are continuously taking pictures of the surface. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome to know. So are you guys hearing the sound or should I explain? Uh, you can explain. I think it'll be great. Yeah. We're not hearing sound. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're talking with the different, these EDL engineers. Uh, what you just saw is uh, part of the spacecraft with the rovers inside that has a heat shield that then gets, you know, uh, sort of protects the rover while it's falling down the atmosphere. So that's what you see here. The heat yes. shield here is protecting the rover from all this heat that's generated as it's falling down. Wow. Yeah, you see all, <laughs> this is the artist renden rendition of like, yeah. very hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's falling down like that. Um, now the landing part is what blows my mind. Eventually, yep. Yeah. So then eventually we uh, have this parachute that helps to slow down uh, the, the part of the spacecraft that's holding the rover. Mm -hmm. uh, and here they're comparing. Uh, perseverance to the previous rover that was called Curiosity because the landing system is actually very similar. So that's part of the reason we sort of borrowed some things that we'd already learned. Uh, can you, can you pause it and re can you reverse the video to where it was comparing Curiosity and per Perseverance real sure, quick? Yeah. I just wanted to comment on something. Yeah. Right there. Yep. I just think, I just like how, they're like, curiosity is old news. And they kind of grayscaled it and they upped the <laughs> color on perseverance. Like a little bit of shade at the curiosity team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in, in reality, that's not really how it is, you know, because the whole reason, the whole reason we're, we're sort of borrowing the structure of curiosity is because it works so well. So we sort of have, it's, it's this thing again, it's so hard for us to test. So we would rather... Uh, borrow something we already know is going to work really well right. and put some new instruments on it and uh, and we know we'll be successful. So yeah. <laughs> that's not really actually the reality at all. <laughs> uh, I'm just being silly. Awesome. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go back into the uh, landing. Yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, we can skip ahead yeah, a little just... bit. Yeah. Perfect. So that's, you know, the, the lake that I was just showing... Um, right. The traverse I was just talking about how we'll drive. That's awesome. Yes. And that's the kind of, did you say Delta or the fan? That's basically what it was. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's called a Delta and then the shape is called a fan. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's when the heat shield comes off and, uh, 
the um, spacecraft is cruising with this parachute, wow. this is when it's taking images of the surface and then it's determining where it should be going uh, based on the different terrain that it's seeing. Wow. And this is all in, as it's falling. Yeah, so it's sort wow. of navigating while it's falling down the atmosphere, basically. Incredible. And yeah, some great views of the landing site. And that's all from satellite images, so that's pretty accurate. Yep, yep. Wow. Yep. And then uh, that is when the sky crane is uh, uh, unleashed. So the sky crane, you can see, is holding the rover. And the sky crane has these... Um, uh, rocket boosters on its sides that it's using to balance in the air. Wow. And then eventually it comes down enough that it's just hovering above the surface. And that's when you have this cable that uh, is sort of unspooled and it sinks the rover down to the earth and then it releases the cables and flies away. And that's how the rover lands. What, Eva, what, what, <laughs> what happened to the, to the thing with the rockets, that other part? Does it just... Explode? Yeah, it just flies away, and then it, you know, eventually lands. Yeah. Oh, it lands somewhere. It doesn't just explode somewhere. I, th I thought that'd be cooler. You know what I mean? Like a little <laughs> fireworks show. But that's why I'm not a scientist for NASA. That's really cool. That's that's incredible to me. Wow. Yeah. So uh, this is a really good movie. A uh, little bit sad we couldn't get the sound, but I encourage everyone to go and watch it. Um, Absolutely. It's really, it's really informative. Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. I think the sound was on mute on the video itself. That's okay. Oh, it, it actually was playing, but it was playing in my AirPods. So uh, I was getting the sound while trying no to worries. talk. But, no worries. Um, yeah. It's all good. Man, that's – wow. This must be such an exciting place for you, especially being a, gra a grad student and being able to work with all these amazing minds and on this amazing mission. Does it get you excited for the future of your career and other space missions that you're going to be a part of? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this, <laughs> I'm kind of hinting my hopes anyways on that the landing is going to be successful and that I'll get to be studying these things that I really, you know, put a lot of work into being able to eventually study. So I talked about this spectrometer and like, I put a lot of work into being able to understand how to use this spectrometer and the, getting right. the data that we need and analyzing that data. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited about that. Uh, there are, you know, just so many questions we've sort of we have touched on what are the overarching goals, but there are so many questions about, uh, just like, what was the climate like at that time? What was the interior structure of the planet like at that time? Um, how is Mars different from earth? Like in terms of um, geology, so things that we look at are, for example, plate tectonics. Why was there not plate tectonics on Mars? And all of these things come together to uh, sort of kind of do a comparison between why could there be life on Earth and uh, why could there be life on Mars or why could there not be life on Mars? And so there, there's so many questions that we still don't know the answer to. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my job to get closer to the answer. And yeah, just unbelievably excited about it <laughs> that's incredible well i'm i'm yeah. hoping and I'm, pr I'm praying that the 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 landing goes successful by the time this airs and that you guys find some amazing evidence of something i don't know what you know i'm hoping we find it would be exciting for us to find organic life um and but i think like you said before the why is there and why isn't there is just as important too and um to kind of wrap this all up, I've got to share with you one of my all-time favorite, uh, two of my all-time favorite films for uh, aliens and, and um, the most realistic in the sense of, uh, you know, aliens, uh, uh, alien movies. And the first one is actually a not so well-known film. It's called Europa. Have you seen it on Netflix? Um, I have not seen a movie called Europa, but I'm certainly familiar with the moon Europa, if that's what it's about. <laughs> oh man, I think it's either called Europa Project or Europa, but either way, it's shot as if it was a documentary, like a found footage film. Uh, Euro oh, Europa Report, that's the name of the film. Eva, you gotta watch this. <laughs> 
it was so realistic. I remember just sitting at my home and I was by myself and I was like, well, this is actually really good. And I'm not going to spoil anything, but it's as real as I feel it would get. So I would love to know your opinion about it. And the second one is called uh, Arrival. Uh, oh, so, Arrival I've watched. Yeah. Do you like that it? That was a great movie. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I loved it. Do you have any your favorite alien, like a life on other planet, kind of re- as realistic as it would get? Do you have any films like that? <gasps> oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are fans of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, I think the reason is that they, they tend to put a lot of sort of scientific thought into how they create their aliens. Um, and you, you get like a lot of different ideas um, because the, the real answer is we don't really know what we, we expect. So that's where Star Trek is great in that uh, it, it explores all of these different ideas. Um, that, will, that will probably be <laughs> the, the one that most of us like the most. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, I got to say thank you again for your time. This has been a great talk with you and I wish you and everybody uh, on the team the best of luck. I really hope it landed safely and I hope you guys continue on uh, with your careers and you keep doing uh, amazing and big things that change uh, our world and society for the better. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I am so happy to have been here and had this opportunity to talk with you guys. And uh, I hope everyone learned something and, uh, and I <laughs> made sense. <laughs> and everyone is as, as excited as I am, or at least feel the excitement a little bit um, more than before. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, take care. And um, yeah, uh, we're going to sign out of Adobe Radio. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. Thank you for uh, Eva and everybody at NASA for everything that you do. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, nice guy digital thank you Peyton Alexander Gorski thank you uh, everyone uh, who's subscribed to our show on YouTube followed us on Instagram we Sam's world Twitter we Sam's underscore world we really appreciate you guys uh, be sure uh, to always remember to listen think and then talk we'll see you later guys 